Hi, everyone. I'm, how many of you know about ESNet? I just want to get a sense. OK, a fair number. That's good, because I thought I was a very different talk, not because I look different, but because it's a DOE-funded uh, user facility in an NSF crowd. So uh, just be kind to me as I, as I go through my slides. So, so you must be wondering, what am I doing up here, right? Uh, why am I here? So this is the reason I'm here. ESNet 6 was a big upgrade project. It got honored with the DOE Project Assessment Award this year. Why? Because we are ahead of time under budget, which is kind of rarely happens. So, <laughs> so given that, I think uh, that, that is what I uh, constitute is the reason why I got invited to speak up here. There is uh, other talks by my colleague, uh, colleagues who are here in, in the room as well. Kate is here sitting on the desk, and she'll be talking uh, later during the breakout sessions uh, uh, this week. So I'm going to mention that as well. So I'm going to talk about ESNet 6, the project, and you know ESNet, uh, and give you some introduction on what ESNet is. Now, I know there are some people that may be looking for a technology talk. This is not going to be a technology talk. It's going to be more about the project and project management and what we did. So I hope that will uh, resonate with, uh, with you all. So first, I'm going to give you a little bit on ESNet overview, what is ESNet, so that you get the context uh, behind the project. I'm going to talk about the project, the different phases uh, from start to finish, uh, and then talk about some lessons learned and that we learned from the project. Uh, so quickly, on ESNet. So ESNet is a mission network. It is uh, a network that uh, carries scientific data between institutions, between instruments. Uh, but the thing is, our, our, our mission has nothing, no word network in it. So our mission is that scientific progress is completely unconstrained by the physical location of instruments, people, computational resources, or data. What we build is a network that actually carries and connects all these stakeholders together, uh, which is instruments, people's computational resources, and data. And our vision is that we, whatever we do, uh, whatever technology we employ, what we build, is to accelerate scientific discovery, because that's kind of the bigger goal that we are all uh, trying for. Now, why, why is this important? Because science is actually a conversation. It's a conversation of data between instruments and scientists and computational resources because they use the data to actually make discoveries. So for one example is one large instrument in Europe, the Large Hadron Collider, that actually sends data all over the world and scientists all over the world use that data to make discoveries and it led to the discovery of the Higgs boson which was uh, uh, a Nobel Prize. Now that all infrastructure, the network infrastructure, the computing infrastructure, the cyber infrastructure is all used to process that and this data gets broadcast out from one big instrument to around the world. But it's not only about big instruments because small sensors that are distributed all over the planet actually connect data that educate us about our climate, uh, about how things are changing, uh, and how actually disasters may, we may get more insight how to prevent those disasters by getting that data. So I put in a, a diagram from ARM user facility, and you can see that people that download the data from that user facility are around the, all around the world. Because uh, climate and when you want to look at the planet, it's an interconnected system, so you want the data to be available so that people can get a holistic view and not a local view of how things are changing. And, and that's important as well. And the networks allow that data to be sent all across uh, the world for people around the world to kind of make their own judgments and models and, and validate what other people are saying. But not only that, <clears throat> we, it is about collaboration. Not one network or not one single research network can do it. So if you think of the Vera Rubin telescope, there are multiple entities, networks, and I think Amlight and Julio is here, that actually help enable get the data from a telescope to the computational resources of the scientists or astronomers that may want to process the data. That data then goes from uh, where it is collected to other places and other collaborators that may uh, look at it as well. So one example is the Polymer Observatory and uh, PTF11KLY, which was uh, dubbed as supernova of, the, of a generation, was observed using uh, NERSC, which is Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, where I, uh, I stay uh, and I work. Uh, so that's where 
it was discovered, but it was about images that were coming, streaming over the network every night. And as the images come in, uh, they used to use crowdsourcing, but they now use machine learning to figure out what's the difference between the previous image and the new image. And if there are good candidates, then scientists look at it more closely, and then they send alerts around the world so that other telescopes can look at that. So that's kind of uh, one of the ways how networks can help through collaboration of multiple networks to get the data to the right scientists. So that's kind of the why uh, we do what we do, which is build networks. The other things we do is ESNet as an entity, as a user facility, connects all the national labs together. And this is not just the Office of Science National Labs. It is all the other national labs from EERE, uh, from NNSA, and all the national labs. And these national labs are uh, looking at science and technology, uh, and, and they collaborate with, with the researchers in NSF land and universities, uh, all of that. But all of these net uh, entities are connected by ESNet, and that's uh, what we do as a user facility. Not only just the national labs, but there are 28 uh, facilities or user facilities like supercomputers, uh, you know, basic energy sciences, uh, environmental research, fusion reactors, all of these user facilities data uh, gets carried uh, by, by ESNet, and so what we call ourselves as the data circulatory system, just like the human circulatory system in carrying data from where it is produced to where it is processed and, and, and new discoveries are made. Now, you can say, is this really being used? So we collect, we have been collecting statistics uh, since 1990 on how much data we move every year. And the network traffic that we have been moving every year has been going exponentially, so approximately 60% year on year since 1990. Now because of the way the graph is and the way exponentials are, it seems like from 1990 to around 20, 2006, it was all flat. But if you zoom in, it's, it is exponential growth all the way through. You see a small dip in 2020, that's the COVID impact, when, when things shut down, when people stopped uh, doing research. But again, it, it has kind of resumed its course. That was just a small blip that happened during the COVID pandemic. Uh, so we moved in the last 12 months more than one and a half exabytes of data. So kind of we can say we are an exascale level facility. Uh, <clears throat> so that's, uh, that's kind of introduction on uh, ESNet. Now, we have been around for the past 30 years, and over the past 30 years, there have been multiple upgrades to this facility. Uh, each upgrade, we are adding some new technology or pushing the envelope uh, or, or kind of stay at the bleeding edge. And, and, and I think in the background, you can see the traffic growing as we uh, have different versions of the facility. And the latest version is ESNet 6, where uh, it was, uh, which was finished in late 2022. And that's the project I'm going to talk about. Uh, and till when that is going to be there, and when we do an next upgrade, we don't have visibility into that at the moment. <clears throat> so let's talk about ESNet 6, uh, the project. I'll just give you some statistics uh, on the top of the, it was a $151 million project, uh, around eight years with scheduled contingency. We finished in six. Uh, and, and I think, you know, uh, I'm going to give you more statistics uh, as the project goes. So one of the things that is different, I think, than from NSF project, and by the way, I'm, on, I'm a co-PI on the Fabric MSRI project, so I have some uh, experience with the MSRI project as well. One what's different is that DOE follows Order 413.3b, which is their program management and project management framework. And, and, and just for people that are not familiar with it, I'll just give you a very high level so there are kind of uh, critical decision points, uh, and there are kind of five of them. CD zero, or critical decision zero, is the mission need. Why are you doing this project? So that's kind of what it addresses. CD one is, hey, have you looked at the alternatives? And what's a range of cost this uh, project will be in? And so that is CD one. Uh, it also includes a conceptual design, because you cannot come up with a cost range or look at alternatives without some kind of a high-level design. CD2 is approved performance baselines. Uh, this is when you fix the numbers. This much amount, this much contingency, this is the scope of the project. Everything is now locked down and ready to, to go. CD3 is start of construction or execution of the project, whatever that we, and CD4 is close out. So that's kind of 
seems very simple, a simple series of steps that gets you from a, from a vision uh, to completion of a project. So that's what we follow. I'm gonna walk you through the ES10X project and each of these stages uh, of the project. Now, before I go that, I just wanna say this was, for the team, this was the first DOE 413.3B project. Uh, so this was something we entered as an organization kind of blind, so to speak. We had not done such of a project before. Our previous upgrades were small or outsourced, so we didn't have to do this uh, process. So this was first time we were upgrading a fully operational facility, so some other constraint was we could not shut down. Sometimes in supercomputer centers you say, shut down, I'm going to upgrade, and then two months later this new facility is up. So there was no planned service downtime. Uh, none of you can do without internet for two or three months or a year or two years. So we, this had to be done uh, while the previous network was running. The new network had to come up and seamlessly transition over. It was a greenfield design and build of the entire network. So we were building it from the fiber up. Uh, it was the first time that all those components were being integrated by the team. So. Uh, and again, we needed more people to do that, so we hired, onboarded, and trained new people, got them on board, almost doubled or tripled the size of the organization during that time. And again, the pandemic uh, came during the middle of the project, so we had to, the amount of coordination, communication, and, uh, and management increased 10x. So that was kind of uh, the, the scenario, the background between the project uh, that we faced. The way I kind of compare it as an analogy is that we were building the plane as it was flying, moving the passengers from a previous plane to the new plane, and then deconstructing the plane uh, and making sure that the, the new plane, nothing happened to that. So that's kind of a thing. So we made some project choices based on these things, and I think part of what I'm gonna, as I reveal those choices, I want you to understand there was, this was the context behind that. Other major facilities may have different context and whatever we did may may not apply. The lessons we learned may may not apply, so, so take it at your, uh, um, you know, after thinking through what we did and why we did it. So CD0, mission need. So this was very critical. So we had kind of three things that we said were driving this. One is, we wanted to manage exponential data growth without increasing our budgets, operating budgets exponentially. So we wanted to manage an exponential growth in a, in a relatively flat budget scenario. We wanted to increase resiliency and reliability. Uh, network was becoming more and more important for every science thing as we hear about data and, and data being an AI. That is kind of the understay of how research gets done. So we wanted to increase the res resilience and reliability of the facility. And we wanted to lay the foundation for flexibility. We did not have a clear view of what would come at us next. I think AI was just starting. This was project started in 2016, so AI was just on the horizon. People were talking of data and data science. So we wanted to make sure that whatever we built had the flexibility to handle whatever new scientific workflows or evolution of scientific workflows would happen. Now, why this was critical is because this defined our KPPs for the project in the, in the product, project execution plan. So each of these mission needs, which was kind of a, uh, a consolidated mission need, became our KPPs. So it was very easy for the reviewers of the project to know how what we were building gonna help us meet our vision and mission. And, and that was really important. So uh, again, to me, this, this step was critical. And the other thing is, we were projecting the future and we wanted to have a 12-year vision. So stepping back and thinking about the why and making sure the why was understood within the organization was very critical for us to have a successful project. Because without this strong foundation, we would be struggling. What should the KPP be? And why, that, why is that KPP important? And why is that relevant? I'm just sharing with you, this was signed in 2016. These are the various... Uh, different signatures uh, and approval of the mission need. It took us around six months to write it, and then around two to three months uh, to go through the process in DOE to get it all signed and, and, and wrapped up. So that was the mission need. It was signed and everything by uh, November 2016, so end of 2016 is when we had a mission need statement. So next stage from CD0 is CD13A. Now you're gonna say, you told us CD0, 1, 2, 3, why this 1 and 3A? So 
while there is a framework, there is some flexibility in the framework. And what this means, 3A means, is you are starting something a long lead execution. So you're getting CD1, which is approving of a cost range and an alternate is analysis, but at the same time, you're making a request to start something on the project early because that's the longer critical path. And so it's CD3 was execution, so 3A means you're executing on a small piece of the project and starting on that early. So, so first, before we got to CD1, we did a conceptual design and alternative analysis. And reviews are an important part of it. And these are in-person reviews, face-to-face uh, -face reviews. So this is kind of just a conclusion and submission of the uh, conceptual design review. And for this reviews, it was very important to get out of the DOE community to get involved and tell us what we were doing. Because you we were afraid of groupthink. We are all kind of working within the facility, thinking about what should we design and what should be the path. So we went out and we got from, obviously we got some reviews from the DOE community, from the NSF community, from international researchers, industry, all to come together. And this is kind of the picture from that time. So you can see there's uh, Brent from uh, NERSC, there is uh, Marike from SURF, which is a network in, in Netherlands, uh, Josh from Google, Akbar from Learn, which is a, a network in Texas, uh, uh, Phil from uh, DREN, which is a defense research and education network, Ilya from Fabric Project, but also Renzi, North Carolina from, from NSF space, and, and Case, an international researcher from University of Amsterdam. So we had these reviewers come and really challenge us on what we were thinking. And this is conceptual design. So this is high level framing and, uh, and we hadn't done the detailed design yet. So that was really good. But what was more important was to make sure that we had a good discussion and, and, and were transparent with the reviewers. So once uh, this was done, we had a test project management review, what we call a director's assist review. So this is something where we do a dry run of, of, of the final stage before. And uh, we had some challenges there. So, so not all reviews are a success, so let me just uh, tell you like that. And you can see that we got 20 recommendations. Now any project that gets 20 recommendations, uh, you know, you, you, you need to be worried. And we were worried, and the reason was we were new to this DOE 413 process and we missed some things, and, and uh, we learned from that. So, if, so uh, in April, we learned about unknown unknowns. So I mean, things that we didn't know about that we should have known about, and the reviews, really helped us find that. So instead of getting upset, I think we took that crisis and said, okay, that's an opportunity to learn and, and to deal with that. So we did learn. So this was April and in, in June, <coughs> we had the real review with DOE and that was uh, signed and, 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 and was approved in August 2018. Uh, the review happened in June and then it takes some months for the review report to make it up the, the signatory stack, so to speak. So uh, one of the things we did uh, on this is that practice makes perfect. So while the reviews and the, and the practice reviews takes a lot of time and energy, and it does take a lot of time and energy from the team, it did help us see things that we were missing and helped us uh, kind of nail the, uh, uh, the final or the more important review, and we passed with flying colors there. So what lessons did we learn from that? So this was kind of, as I said, never leave a crisis uh, unattended. So what we learned was tailoring is key. So while there is a project management process, there is something which is often not looked at carefully is tailoring. So how do we adapt the management framework to meet the uniqueness of the project? And every project is unique, and that matching and that tailoring is really important. And I think innovative thinking on how we execute the project is as important as the technology. So we sometimes focus, focus a lot on technology and technology innovation, but I focusing on, on the project execution is equally important. So what was that? We went on a limb and asked for $40 million. So for a $155 million, $151 million project, we asked for $40 million on a conceptual design to do a long lead procurement to build the optical uh, uh, network uh, as, as a long date procurement. Now, that was a risk. Many people told us that was a risk. How can you ask for so much money with so little work done when you haven't finalized the design yet? But it allowed us to ramp stuff. It allows us to transition the network, which was build the airplane a little bit. And luckily, we didn't know that then, that it helped us get ahead of supply chain issues that came from COVID. We didn't know it then. This was looking back. 
uh, that's what it helped us. So uh, let me spend a little bit more time on this tailoring, and, and I'll give you a summary of the tailoring that we did for ESNet 6 project. Now, more details will be presented by Kate in, in her uh, one-hour session uh, on Thursday in the project management session. So one of the things we did was we, we started with EVM. That's the default for any big project. You start with earned value management. But we then realized all the challenges we were facing with the project. We had uh, procurements that were RFPs, so there were big chunks of money going at a single point in time, so it was not a constant spend of money. There was software development, which was done, being done in an agile way, which is very different from how the project is or when you construct a facility. So we went to something called Milestone Execution Index. Now, that was something we uh, looked at examples within DOE to help create, uh, but that was different, and, and it took us time. We wrote documents on how this would work, but it helped us identify critical schedule areas and highlighted the potential issues in the forecast so that it was giving us a, a stoplight based colors and a value that we could track and graph at the same time that related to our schedule and our execution. So what you said was we had level four milestones and are we hitting our milestones or not? And based on that and, and comparing that to the critical path, we were able to see how healthy is the project executing. And that's what you really want to know is, is the project executing in a healthy way based on its goals or objectives or not? The second one we used was level of effort. Now, you have to realize we were a <clears throat> operating expense-funded upgrade. So there are people that get line item construction money, which is different, and this may not apply for that because they hire a standing army, and the standing army is costing money all the time, and that is different. But in our sense, we had to keep the current facility working while upgrading, so we needed resources to go back and forth because talent is limited. Also, we wanted our existing people to know what the, how the new network is built because they were then being tasked to maintain it. So unlike a standing army in a, in a building where there are construction workers and they, and they do stuff where level of effort is not something that you need, we moved towards a percentage of FTE. So we said 40% of this FTE, this expert is on on, on ES Net 6, and the 60% is on, on, on maintaining the existing facility. So that was kind of very different, <clears throat> but it allowed us also to track how much time was being spent, are we underspending on labor, but it did give us uh, that level of effort, gave us uh, a good indication. Estimated completion costs uh, were updated monthly through our forecasting process. So. Sometimes during a project, you may have a different financial system. Since we were an operating um, budget-funded facility, our burdens and our costs and our program costs, our existing facility costs, we needed to get a good sense. Are we overspending that we're going to put our existing facility at risk? Are we underspending that we are having excess money? So what we decided to do was to use our financial management system to track both, and we used estimated completion uh, was kind of done monthly based on how much uh, was actuals versus forecasted, and then we used that to manage uh, financially the program. And the last thing is, which was different, was project acceptance memos. <clears throat> so since we were a continuously operating facility, one of the ways you could have done this is build this new facility in parallel to the existing one get it all up and running, and then have a flag day and transition users from one to the other. That would have worked, but that would have cost us, the taxpayers, a lot more money because you would have to build two facilities almost fully and run in parallel. So what we decided was to do a phased approach, which means we would build a component of the new thing, get it up and running, decommission that of the existing network and move it into production, before we started working on the next phase. This allowed us to basically take costs that were more, I would say, non-recurring costs, charge it to the project, but operating costs, which are always variable and hard to predict and cause a lot of variance, we moved that to the program because we transitioned into operations. And the way we did it was something called project acceptance memos. These memos would be signed by the, the federal project director, 
uh, we had ev enough evidence to say it was operating, it was completed, and then we would transition it into operations and move to the next. So essentially, while we had a full project, we transitioned pieces into operation during the project. So at the end, at the closeout, all we had to show them was all the project acceptance memos to say that, hey, we had built what you had paid us to build, and, we, and that was operating and meeting the requirements. So, uh, it was easy, but this was something new that we had to come up with, uh, given our situation of operating funds and continuously running uh, facility. So what was key in this whole tailoring process was the IPT. Without a functional IPT, this would not have happened. And IPT is important, and, and I think we make these charts, but I cannot underscore how critical a well-functional, well-functioning IPT is, because all this tailoring was discussed there uh, there was understood what artifacts we needed to produce, how we would educate the reviewers, because the reviewers that came in didn't know about these tailoring, so we had to figure out how to educate the reviewers as well, and, and, and then get approvals and get sign-offs. So the IPT was critical in having those discussions uh, by the federal project director, Kate uh, being here, have that discussion, write up things, uh, invite guests into the IPT that were experts in the area, in the project management area, and get it approved. So, so that was kind of uh, really important, and I can't underscore the importance of having a good IPT. So CD23 implementation. So the next phase is implementation. Again, uh, we did a detailed design review then. I just want to say that how important it is for the reviewers to actually talk about the team, not just about the technology. I think we all nitpick on whether they got this sentence right or that sentence wrong. But it was really important for, for the reviewers to talk about how the team behaved during the review, how they interacted. And I think it is important for the reviewers to see how the team interacts too, because you can find, you can figure out the health and the success of the project based on how team interacts with each other, how ha they have respect for each other, how do they answer questions. Do they delegate the questions to the person that knows within the room rather than the person who is a leader take that on? And those things were really important for the reviewers. Now, of course, uh, I just want to say we did well. We made some choices for people that were in the SDN era. We did not choose a white box switch router. as, And you know that was the major momentum was go SDN, go white box. We decided not to do that. It was a big decision on our part. And the review committee helped validate. And, and support our decision uh, uh, as well. Again, I would say that by this time, it's four years since we started the project, finally I would say it was a breeze, uh, sort of a breeze, uh, that we didn't have as many challenges as we had in the previous reviews. Now we had also learned how to prepare for the review. Uh, we would do dry runs, we would build a website for the reviewers, we would put all the documents there. How we presented the review also, we had learned by this time. Now, I just want to say for the people who like putting reviews on projects that no review is ever a breeze. It takes months of preparation by the team, so don't just willy-nilly add reviews, but reviews are important. But what you have to understand is that there are a huge overhead for the team, and it will take us four months to prepare for a review from start to finish. And, and that, that does take time away from executing on the project because all the technical leads are preparing slides and talking about seeing what, uh, what they should do and we would f identify holes and we would fill them. So we, I think reviews are important but they should be thoughtfully added to a project uh, because it does take a, a lot of effort. So this is the PEP that was finally approved for the CD23 execution. Uh, in 2020. So now you can see the date, uh, February 25th, 2020, and I think you know what is coming next. <laughs> uh, you know what is coming next. So, <clears throat> so before the vaccines were available, we had to execute, and we, we had to make a decision. Do we go and tell, like, should we redo all the budgeting and redo the review with pandemic and say we want to delay? or we go ahead, and we decided to go ahead. So we lit 15,000 miles of fiber across the US during the 2020 pandemic pre-vaccine. And you can see all the dots. All the dots on this US map are places where equipment was deployed during that time. People were not flying. The installers were driving from location to location. Uh, and, and, and I think one of the things the team is very proud of is that no COVID transmissions in installers, which were contractors or ESNet staff due to this install, 
happen. So that was something that was managed and that was increased. Obviously, the complexity every two weeks, I think Kate was writing uh, COVID reports and updates to DOE on how the what was going on, uh, what precautions were we taking, had there been any transmissions or not. Uh, we deployed uh, this uh, uh, during uh, the vaccine. The next slide is actually uh, uh, animation. So on the left-hand side is the network ES-105, the previous network getting decommissioned at the same time as the network was being built on the right. And as each link and segment was being built, the PAMs were being followed through, things were being transitioned into operations. Now the right one keeps repeating, but you'll see at some point it turns all green and uh, uh, the left side is already, you can say, is already decommissioned. And the last decommissioning was on October 9th, 2020. Uh, and, and you can see it becomes green. It is going to restart again. Uh, but that's kind of uh, our animation of month by month as we were doing this during uh, the pandemic. We also transitioned to a new router platform, uh, kind of during the time it shows, at some point in time, we were doing 10 uh, router decommissions and installs and decommissions, and that was all due to software and automation. So we invested a lot in software and automation in order to get that done, and this is how we, how we managed to do the pace that we did. So we get to CD4 and, and close out. <clears throat> so uh, these were the, uh, KPPs, I know I had not shared them with you before. So three KPPs on the backbone, on capacity, on automation, on resiliency and, and reliability, and on flexibility. We had threshold KPPs and objective KPPs. And I talked to you about the overhead of, of the reviews. At some point in time, we had met all the threshold KPPs and most of the objective KPPs. The ones that we didn't meet were because of supply chain delays. And we knew that because of supply chain delays, equipment was getting delayed. So we made a decision with DOE, with the IPT, to, to call the project complete based because we had met the requirements of the project with the threshold KPPs. And so that's what we did. So in a closeout, we kind of uh, built this network, uh, 15,000 miles of fiber, 300 closes, 46 terabits of capacity with 400 gigs to one terabit of service applied with lots of spans to increase resiliency and, and resiliency, and this was all done. So that led to the closeout report. I'm gonna talk about some lessons learned. We did not know about the pandemic when we started, but we were planning for snow in our installation. Uh, what if we could not drive to those locations? So what we did was we trained all staff on formal risk management. We actually got a professor to come and hold classes on risk management. We had people write risks and, and practice writing risks. Because it is, in the end, I think if you, if you, thinking of risks is also an art that has to be learned. And, and if you don't do it, and if you just kind of do it without thinking about it, you don't start thinking from a risk way. Every IPT meeting we would start and we'd say, what risks have retired and what are new risks? That was the start of every IPT meeting. That, that was how it started. So we needed a dedicated risk manager. So we had a dedicated risk manager that was identifying, quantifying, developing risk mitigation strategies, talking to all the technical staff uh, as new risks came. Is this a new risk? When they said, I'm having some trouble here. I'm falling behind. Why? Is this a new risk? Is that something we need to tackle? Is that something we need to think about? So all our risks management to address things like snow and weather and, and, and things actually helped us with the pandemic because we knew how to think about risk. So it was just, oh, it's a new risk. What does it mean? How do we manage it? What is a mitigation? I'm not saying it's that easy, but it was, it was, it at least helped with the framework. The other thing was team, team growth. So hiring and onboarding was critical. So we had a team wide meeting on hiring every week. Uh, how many people have applied? What does it look like? What is the status? So in 2017, we were 45 people. In 2022, we were 120 people. So that's how the facility grew while we were implementing the project. And we could not have done it without a completely dis distributed team. So we decided that we won't have everyone in the one location as we started hiring. And that distributed team, team helped us. So when it came to pandemic and Zoom, we were already practiced with Zoom. It was not a new technology for us. So that also helped us during and the transition, and then DOE 413B. It was a bit painful, uh, but it was a growth opportunity. We learned 
uh, tailoring, we learned how to do project management, and I think our entire organization has a much better understanding of project and project management, project managers and respect for them than we had previously. So that has been really a good growth opportunity uh, for the whole facility. So six years from concept to done, this is the whole timeline in one chart, starting at CD0, uh, end of 2016, beginning of 2017. Our early forecast finish date was January 2023. We finished it in, uh, in, in May. That was the six months uh, ahead of schedule. We had two years of contingency, schedule contingency. We didn't use that. So 2025 was the real project uh, deadline. And, and so that's kind of, uh, so it was kind of like given pandemic, given supply chain delays, a fact that the team could do it. Now it's not that we didn't have delays. There are dotted lines which shows how each project got delayed, but we were still within uh, uh, the, the framework of, of, of being successful. So it was not that we didn't have any impact uh, uh, due to COVID. This is what the new network looks like. This is more of a marketing map than an engineering map. Uh, shows uh, the, 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 all the sites and the network upgrades uh, that are done. And I just want to reiterate, I mean, this was uh, success is because of the people. I, and that is really important. It was not because we had some magic. It was not because we had some money. It was just because of the people that contributed. And I'm very grateful for all the people that uh, work at ESnet and that contributed to this project. Some have retired since then. Uh, really grateful for their efforts because that really uh, helped us implement. This is who the people are, and there are two people here, Jason and Kate uh, are here. And these are the names of the people that contributed to the project, and they are the ones that made this project successful. So, and again, not only them, the lab, the site office, the project management office, the DOE project managers, program managers, really everyone contributed in making this success. And I think we underestimate how much of a village it takes to get a project done. And it takes a lot of coordination and effort. And uh, kudos to all of you that work on, on, on uh, these large infrastructure projects. So Kate will share more details on Thursday at the project management breakout, 3.45 PM. Uh, so please look forward to that talk. If you want to learn more about MEIs and EACs and and cost and schedule. Uh, and thank you guys for listening to me. I know we are different, but thank you for inviting me and, and, and listening uh, to me on, on and giving me an opportunity to share about the ESnet project. So thank you. Any questions? questions? Yes, absolutely. Happy to take questions. Hey, Ender, uh, thanks for a great talk, and congratulations on such a smooth rollout, even though you don't have a site in Austin. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, but I, so I was curious and took lots of notes on your project management stuff. You mentioned some places like doing software-defined routers versus you know the sort of vendor hardware-encrypted routers where the panel supported decisions you made. But you were saying, particularly in that sort of conceptual design phase, that uh, you know, they made a lot of recommendations that changed it. Can you give some examples of things you got from panels that changed what you built? <laughs> so. It's like digging through memory. Uh, I think the panels always pushed us to think of higher goals than we did. I think we were very narrowly thinking of implementing stuff. They told us to think about science workflows and data workflows a lot more, so instead of just the network. And I think that helped us think uh, add things that th talk to us about resiliency and reliability. And the only reason we didn't go with the software-defined routers was resilience and reliability. Who would support it? And we didn't have the band power to support it. The panel recommended us on hiring. So without their express support on hiring, saying you cannot implement it with the, with the workforce you have. You guys will fail. And, and those are the kind of things that the reviews really helped us go back and, and then we had to address those. So any recommendations they made or findings they made, we had to go back and write a document which said how we would address it. It helped us identify those risks. It helped us put in a process to address them. So it's not that they dramatically went off in a room and did a new design and told us, here is a design for you. But they told us where our risks and vulnerabilities were in what we were doing. And that helped us go back and, and, and think about it. And I, I think it's just a diversity of thought that is really important that the reviewers give. <clears throat> Bill. Hey, Ender. Uh, 
thanks also uh, again from all of us for your time and, and we're really glad to hear the different perspective. One thing uh, I wonder if you could just expand on a little bit uh, for us, it's a little different, is the notion of uh, threshold versus objective KPPs, uh, with the objective one being sort of the stretch goal. Um, what's the process for, just loosely speaking, of, of how you would set one versus the other and, and how that's overseen? So again, I think, that, so all of that is based on risk and contingency, right? So you have scheduled contingency, which says, hey, I want to get done by this date, but I need a, a year more or six months more, and that's my scheduled contingency because something went wrong. You have cost contingency saying, I have this much money, and I need a little bit more money in case I'm, uh, you know, RFP comes higher or cost go, or it takes more time to do this that we didn't predict or unknown unknowns. Uh, as we say, so we had money associated with each of those buckets. And then there is scope contingency. So scope contingency is threshold to objective. And what that means is that you also want to capture positive risks. Risks are not always negative. So if you were able to do with less money, what scope would you add to, to enhance the value of the project that you're doing? So threshold means the bare minimum to succeed, and you would call project a success. So threshold is really important. That's what you meet, and, and if you meet threshold, project is success. But if you had extra time, if you had extra people, if you had extra money, you did something good or some windfall happened, how will you enhance the value of the project? Thinking of that ahead of time is much better than when extra money or extra people are available, then you're trying to say, what should we put the money or people on? So thinking that ahead of time and thinking of that as an objective KPP helped us know where to direct those resources, that money, that uh, maybe add an option in the procurement, that if we have extra money, we'll buy this. So that thinking at, helped us at the RFP stages in dealing with the vendors and in, in, in kind of designing and planning that. So that's kind of, what I would say is objective uh, and threshold versus objective. And if you think of in terms of risk and contingency, it, it will make sense. Any other questions? In NSF speak, that's in the rig as essential and desirable. Okay, <laughs> essential and desirable. Makes sense. I really like the uh, concept of the PAMs, you yeah. know, that you were doing that detailed, it almost like looked like a detailed commissioning, which is really nice. But I was going to ask you, you kind of have a distributed project, but what if it was a more integrated project? Would you have, with all these detailed commissionings, would you have problems in the integration later on of the total thing? I mean, that's always a risk, but that's what you, so you design the interfaces in your detailed design, right? So you, you kind of, if I think I'm understanding your question correctly, so there were a few things. We were a continuously operating facility, so there was program funding to take on. And many times when it's a, just a construction funding, there is no operations budget to transition to using PAMS. So you kind of are stuck with kind of maintaining some things that you finish ahead of time on the construction budget because you have to keep that up and alive and pay the maintenance. So there was that kind of uh, advantage we have. So PAM suited us because we had an operating facility. Uh, on the other hand, it helped us not have to budget all the maintenance costs that accrue when the project runs for six, seven years. So there is a lot of, and, and those become variable, and those are percentages of, of, of things, and it's very hard to account for that, and you then start accumulating variances year on year and on year, and then the variances become large, and they look really bad on paper. So I don't know if I'm addressing your question directly, because I, did, I was not in that situation where, where we thought about that. So, I don't know if I have a right answer for you, but I'm just giving you our actually, thought process. Actually, you brought up another thing there. Since you're distributed, let's say you're doing the Seattle to Denver link or yeah. something. Once you get it done, 
with those PAMs, yeah. then you can pass it on to uh, O and M. Yes. And you don't have to worry about it anymore. Exactly. You don't have to carry that, which would actually have a false variance in your construction, right? Yes. So that's great. Thanks. Yeah. So you talk about that you decided not to use EVM. Mm -hmm. Can you share the reasons that what drives that decision? That <laughs> I don't know, Kate. Would you feel more comfortable answering that, or do you want me to? Okay, I, I will. Uh, I'll see if Kate can answer that, and I'll add something to that. Sure. So we actually did try. I guess I could. Stand up. Yeah. Uh, we did try EVM uh, leading up to our CD1 3A review. Um, so we were doing the schedule management in Primavera 6, and you know a lot of people use Cobra to tie the two together. Um, given that we did this was not a line item project, so we were actually funding this out of our operational funds, which has all the burdens and everything like that in it. And so, and given that it was level of effort, well, we turned it to level of effort because it was the same people doing, you know, maintaining the daily network at the same time while building and commissioning ESnet 6. And so it was just far too complicated. We found out that people were, we were basically spending more time trying to do the accounting on EVM than actually doing the project work. And so uh, given that, so we did it in our financial management system. We had very specific uh, cost and paid, you know, we basically, be talking about this on Thursday, but uh, we ch changed its level of effort just because it was too much overhead, and all of our reviewers agreed that it just was not a good fit. We were the mismatch between Covra and our financial management system just wasn't working, and it was it was a mess. Basically. And maybe it depends on how EVM is implemented, but for us, the burdens, the organizational burdens, the operational burdens, the procurement burdens, you had to every time verify. Does the COBRA system have the same buttons as a program? Are the funds then reflected back on the program? So there was, you basically were managing two independent systems and making sure they're coordinated, which was, as, as Kate said, taking more time and, and more mistakes possibility than doing it this way. And so that's why, again, it was not easy to convince the people that are used to EVM as a default that we wanted to do it this way. So I did not go through you know, two or three months of effort it took us to convince, but we were first convinced that it was not a useful, given the six years of, or four years of more work to do, that this would, this would cause us errors. And, and I think that's what actually helped people is that by doing this process, we would generate more errors on the project given the differences, uh, given evidence that had happened already, uh, then it would give us benefits. So we then, had an, but then you have to pro provide an alternative. You can't just say, I won't do EVM because it's hard. You have to provide an alternative. So we had an alternative ready that everyone was convinced would help us manage in a similar way, and, and that's what uh, convinced the IPD and then the, uh, the uh, Office of Project Assessments and DOE that that was something that was acceptable to them. I just wanted to add one more thing that yeah. to kind of back that up. Is that, uh, and I'll, again, I have this in my presentation on Thursday, but uh, because the 413.3b process does allow for tailoring, there's actually one change called change four that notes that IT specific projects like high performance computing and high performance networking, because they're operationally funded as opposed to line item, it actually discourages the use of EBM, EVM in those projects for the reasons that we're just discussing, is that they said that you really should do away with that so you can focus on getting the work done while you're having to keep the, operate, the facility fully operational. And that helped us, that, that provided us some backing, yes. I know I'm over time now, I'm, I'm running on negative time. Uh, I'll be happy to take questions uh, during the break, but if there is any burning questions online, and I didn't check online if there are any questions, uh, at least maybe one, uh, allow the online participants, participants to have one question. No questions online? Okay, thank you guys.